Join us at the Community Cats Podcast and the National Kitten Coalition for the Online Kitten Conference, which will be held on June 9th from 7 to 8.30 p.m. Eastern Time and June 10th and 11th from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Time. This three-day virtual gathering coordinated with the National Kitten Coalition will feature presentations by experts on raising and saving kittens, setting up and managing kitten-centered shelter programs, and more. Click for details at www.communitycatspodcast.com and sign up today. Recordings will be available, so don't delay. We hope to see you there. You've tuned in to the Community Cats Podcast. Ready? Let's go. Welcome to the Community Cats Podcast. I'm your host, Stacey LeBaron. I've been involved helping homeless cats for over 20 years with the Merrimack River Feline Rescue Society. The goal of this podcast is to expose you to amazing people who are improving the lives of cats. I hope these interviews will help you learn how you can turn your passion for cats into action. And today we have two very special guests with us. Dr. Bob Whedon and Dr. Bob Murtaugh. We have them with us for for today. And we're going to talk a bit about the AVMA and the president elections that are coming up this summer. But first, um, Dr. Murtaugh, could you um, introduce yourself uh, to our listeners? Sure. Thanks, Stacey. I appreciate the opportunity to be here with you and to address your your audience. Uh, I'm uh, four decades in the profession of veterinary medicine, a University of Minnesota graduate. I've spent time in academia, the nonprofit sector, and, and uh, private practice. I'm boarded in veterinary internal medicine and emergency and critical care. Got a special um, interest in the shelter world and, and animal welfare. I've uh, been involved on, in Portland, Oregon with the um, some changes around their animal control at one point in time. And I'm currently in Austin, Texas, and work very closely with Austin Pets Alive and a group called Shadow Cats to take care of business around here in Central Texas. So pleasure to be here today. Thank you. And Dr. Whedon, you are a frequent flyer at the Community Cats Podcast. Uh, just to share folks quick uh, background on you. Well, thank you, Stacy. It is a pleasure to be here again. I enjoy coming on because I believe in what you're doing and getting the word out about, uh, you know, responsible uh, pet care, uh, animal care, cat care, and in my world, dog care. I, um, I like Dr. Murtaugh, I'm a, uh, a veterinarian. I spent four decades in the profession, too. I graduated from Purdue University. Um, was in private practice for a while, went to academia, trained uh, veterinary students at the University of Illinois in high quality, high volume spay neuter techniques, retired and moved to Florida and thought I'd play golf every day, but decided that uh, I'd rather spay cats than play golf. And I'm working now uh, three days a week sterilizing animals here in Florida. Also got a legislative initiative going where we're trying to get the Practice Act change to allow veterinarians who are licensed in another jurisdiction and in good standing to be able to do spay-neuter here in Florida to help with the shortage of manpower in the spay-neuter community. So, um, and I support Dr. Murtaugh's candidacy for president-elect of the AVMA. He's a forward thinker. I've gotten to know him fairly well recently and, and uh, would be very proud to have him represent me uh, within that organization. So, Dr. Whedon, you mentioned this, so uh, I, I'm going to ask Dr. Murtaugh this question. What role does the AVMA play in rules, uh, you know, legislation, regulations? What is it really that the AVMA does? Yeah, the AVMA's uh, primary role is advocacy, and uh, they're involved in, in legislative initiatives uh, in support or against, depending upon the circumstance, both on a federal level and on a state level, and have a, a very broad um, legal team and, and uh, lobbyists that help us on a profession-wide uh, level with regard to, to many issues. So they testify before state legislatures and in and, uh, front of Congress and, and uh, have a, a large role in, in um dealing with issues, whether it's uh, spay neuter or uh, uh, avian influenza or take your pick, you know, so. 
And why would you like to be president of the AVMA? Yeah, so like Dr. Wheaton, I, I retired recently from, from the active day-to-day uh, aspects of our profession and, and um, still feel a, a passion for, for issues. And I feel we have some significant challenges. They're, the good news is they're challenges of abundance. I mean, we have on all fronts a uh, shortage of uh, veterinary providers and, and uh, we need to have some vision with regard to not just short-term uh, fixes, but also intermediate and long-term sustainable uh, uh, plans to, to uh, address the issues around the work, workforce uh, shortage in our profession. So uh, you were talking about um, workforce shortages, and there are some short-term and medium-term and, and long-term issues there. Can you specify that a little bit more? Is it veterinarian shortages, technicians, supply shortages? What are the issues that you see, or is it multifaceted? Yeah, it's a multifaceted problem, so it requires sort of a multi-pronged approach, but but uh, when I speak about workforce shortages, it's, it's primarily numbers of people uh, in various roles. I think um, the AVMA's focus, and rightly so at the moment, is on efficiencies in practice and utilization of technicians, uh, areas that we've sort of neglected for uh, a long period of time. And so I'm, I'm grateful to see that they have those uh, sort of short-term goals in mind, and that's important. But, uh, you know, there's 15,000 ads on Indeed for open positions for veterinarians across the country right now. So that's a job posting service. 40% of shelters, you guys know this, don't have adequate veterinary services on a regular basis. So we have some needs that aren't going to be met simply by improving efficiencies in clinical practice or equine practice or, or take your pick. Uh, we have some real needs for additional people to enter our profession, both on the, the staff professional side and the veterinary professional side. What are you seeing happening at veterinary schools? There's huge costs involved with becoming a veterinarian these days. And my understanding is there's quite a few more law schools than there are veterinary schools out there. What are what are your thoughts in, in that arena? Yeah, that's an interesting uh, statement you just made, Stacey. So uh, I think we graduate somewhere around 35,000 lawyers a year and we graduate around 4,000 veterinarians a year across the country. So um, we, we face an issue of uh, from 1980 until 2010, we opened up only one veterinary school, and that was Western U in Pomona, California. The population of the United States grew by 100 million people during that 30-year period of time. So we're a little bit behind um, where we need to be with regard to, to workforce. Uh, you're, you're exactly right about cost of education. Uh, the good news there is the trend in the past few years has been um, that that ratio of uh, debt to income has come down significantly and is in a reasonably uh, good position from a standpoint of veterinarians being able to handle their student loans. I think we still have challenges in arenas like shelter medicine and rural animal practice where maybe the income aspects aren't what they still maybe need to be, but uh, you know the trends are good there. And, and I think uh, you know, if you graduate 8,000 veterinarians, you're going to supply a lot more to all of the areas of need than you do when you only graduate 4,000 veterinarians. So, There are a lot of questions around through the state regulations and how they interrelate with one another. I'm up here in New England, so I can drive an hour and I'll be in another state, but I can't have a veterinarian from New Hampshire come into Vermont to do a spay-neuter spay a you know, without having license in that state, without having something called reciprocity. Is that a conversation that you are seeing out there happening frequently and maybe explain a little bit more detail about what reciprocity is? Yeah, I think, and Dr. Whedon can comment on this as well since he's knee deep into it, but, you know, reciprocity is, uh, you know, I would be uh, an advocate for, um, uh, nationwide reciprocity with respect to people that are licensed and, and in good standing in various states that they could easily obtain a license in another state. I think for the activity that you're describing, Stacy, simply providing an exemption, especially in a close to area, a, a close knit area like New England, where people could cross borders easily and, and go back and forth for 
a service to society like spay neuter if you're a veterinarian in good standing in new hampshire and want to go to uh, burlington for a, a spayathon um you know uh, and you're working with licensed veterinarians from the state of vermont uh, a license exemption or something of that nature for that particular purpose and the preventative care that might come along with that single visit sort of um opportunity for for new pet owners or existing pet owners i think is something that probably should be addressed and that's again something where the avma working with the american association of state veterinary boards and and others could make a uh, that change uh not without some difficulty because there's always people that are advocating for states rights but it can be done if the push is there and, and the reasonableness is there and the collaboration is there so i think it's an example of where there needs to be more sort of uh, pointed advocacy on the part of uh, the AVMA as an example across states uh, bringing us together instead of of, uh, of uh, not exercising that influence that an organization that's national could have on our professional approaches. I'm going to ask Dr. Whedon to jump in here and maybe ask a few questions about access to care equaling access to spay and neuter. And before we jump into that topic, though, Dr. Whedon, if you do want to add anything, since you are very focused on reciprocity at this point in time, feel free to, to chime in with a few words on your on that, too. Well, I, I do want to comment because the American Veterinary Medical Association in 2020 released a report entitled The Economic State of the Veterinary Profession. And, and what really struck me about that was that uh, it was estimated that approximately 13% or about a little over 9,000 of the U.S. companion animal veterinarians were over 65 years of age. And another 26%, a little over 18,000, were between 56 and 65. Now, you know, I live in Florida. We have this thing called snowbirds. We have a number of veterinarians who may spend part of their time here in the state from perhaps Vermont, where, you know, I got my air conditioning on today, Stacey. I bet you got your heat on. <laughs> um, you know, and a lot of these snowbird veterinarians could very possibly uh, contribute to this manpower shortage. And one of the things we're doing in Florida is we have um, legislation in both the House and the Senate that exempts veterinarians who are licensed in good standing in another jurisdiction from the need to obtain a Florida veterinary license in order to provide spay neuter and wellness preventative wellness services at the time of spay neuter, and and that's kind of a nice segue, I think, into the discussion of spay neuter being uh, a, an integral part of access to care. So, I'll throw it back to you. So, Dr. Murtaugh, in your opinion, what does access to care really mean? Yeah, I think it's it's several levels. I mean, I think there's obviously an economic uh, aspect. There's a geographic aspect. There's a species specific aspect, and and uh, I'm probably missing a few things there. But you know, for me, it's it's um, again all of the above. And and uh, you know, uh, we know that especially on the pet animal side, that human animal bond is is uh, beneficial for human health. It's not simply a nice to have it's a or a privilege it actually um uh helps uh, sustain well-being of individuals and and there's you know scientific evidence now to prove that in, in many regards so uh you know i think legislatively looking at taking that as an example um uh you know we could estimate the benefits to human health care costs maybe we should reflect some of that back into the the um, economic standing of people that have lower incomes that could benefit from having pets uh, in their household or, or being able to just address the basic needs of those pets. So uh, it's essentially kind of a food stamps for dogs and cats program, if you will. There's been an estimate of uh, 2.7 million sterilization surgeries that did not happen during the pandemic. And then also, I have heard phrases like, oh, well, the low-cost, high-volume spay-neuter clinics, they've been doing all the spay-neuter, so private practice clinics haven't been doing as much spay-neuter as they may have 20-plus years ago. 
Do you feel that that's a a trend that has been happening? And is there a way for us to get spay neuter back into private practice? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, Dr. Whedon's probably again in a better position to comment on that than I am. But yeah, I, I think there has been a trend. I mean, I think um, you know, and it's a good trend because I think the the uh, the advent of high volume spay neuter services in many communities has actually helped us with population control and and uh, uh, potential zoonotic disease spread and, and many other things. So there's there's benefits there. You know, I, I think given the workforce shortage that we have in in many practice environments, that it would probably be hard to ramp it up. Uh, I mean, everybody's trying to swim as fast as they can against the current these days. And so I think, uh, you know, things like Dr. Whedon's proposal in Florida for um, veterinarians that have the ability and the interest and, and uh, uh, the passion that, that we should try to harness that and try to actually increase um spay neuter services across the country uh and again here's an area where uh the avma and state vmas could be advocates for for that sort of volunteerism if you will and and uh it, it in the end it's helping our society it's helping our profession it's doing the right thing in my view so you know i was at vmx um i don't know what about a month ago and i was talking to a florida veterinarian who practice owner about this impending legislation and she was like oh my god that would be wonderful because i don't do spay neuter in my practice i don't i just don't have the time nor the expertise but if there was somebody who was semi-retired that i could hire say two days a week just for the morning to do you know spay neuter they can do more than one an hour and and actually it's kind of like the old saying, you know, I just wanted the milk. I didn't want to have to buy the whole cow. So if I could get someone to come in and just do spay neuter under this proposed exemption, it would generate income for Florida licensed veterinarians that are practice owners. And it, in my mind, you know, that's a win-win situation. Yeah, that's a very good point. I mean, it's community service in that locale. It's also a practice builder from a standpoint of PR and marketing, as well as just new client acquisition. So I think that sort of um, hadn't really thought of it in that context, Bob. I had thought of it more as, uh, you know, s- s- high volume spay neuter locations, but a sort of marrying of the private sector with your uh, initiative could could really, because uh, I'm sure there are ORs and practices that are are silent for, for parts of days or days of the week. So that could be... Um, a uh, really strong sort of geographic spread, if you will, to get the job done. So I like it. Well, and also in the less populated areas where the demand wouldn't be that huge, maybe somebody's coming for just a day or two to go play golf at the golf course around the corner that they've always wanted to play at, but they do a couple of days of surgery on the side to make the trip worthwhile. Yeah, no, good points. <laughs> Cats of the Wild is the podcast for cat lovers who want to make a difference. Listen to inspiring and engaging stories of wild cat conservation and learning how you can help protect cats all over the world. Search for Cats of the Wild in your favorite podcast app now. Do you want to make things easier on yourself and the others in your organization? Our friends at Dubert have teamed up with the Dallas Pets Alive and Spay Neuter Network teams, and together they have created the Companion Case Management Module. It allows you to be more proactive with all your organization's needs. Create cases for your clients and organize them by type. Whether it is a rehoming situation, a pet parent needing food or medical assistance, or simply spay and neuter inquiries, CCM can help you manage all of them right from the Dubert system. Plus, a huge bonus, it allows you to connect with those clients right from the case so there is no need to open up new windows for emails or pull out your phone for text messages. Check it out and learn more at www.dubert.com to get started today. Ever wanted to quickly connect, collaborate, or problem solve with others in the animal welfare field who are, you know, real people? Look no further than Maddie's Pet Forum. Maddie's Pet Forum brings people of animal welfare together with the common goal to keep more people and pets together. We share ideas, expertise, offer each other support, resources, and more. Visit forum.maddiespetforum.org slash cats. Maddie's Pet Forum. Come for an answer. Stay for the community. 
Dr. Whedon, is there anything else on the topic of access to care that you would like to ask Dr. Murtaro? You know, I firmly believe that that um, that stay neuter is uh, an essential element of access to care, and and I, I guess I, I would ask. Uh, Dr. Murtaugh, if he feels the same way, you know, I, I'm thinking that, uh, you know, we, we've done such a good job of getting the have your pets fixed uh, message out there. And so clients are, are, are motivated to get their animals sterilized. Um, the problem now is that, that, you know, they're having a hard time um, finding these services and because of the lack of access to care um as a result of a shortage of spay neuter surgeons and and you know this obviously has the unintended consequence of leading to to more litters of, of puppies and kittens and the cause of these unwanted litters has shifted from simply irresponsible owners to a lack of accessible care and so I guess I would ask Dr. Murtaugh his feelings on the the position of spay neuter in the whole access to care. You know, I and and, and I don't mean to be answering my own question, but I, I sterilize animals three days a week, and a large percentage of the ones I do have never been to a veterinarian before. And and we have the opportunity to get them started on a, a lifetime of preventative wellness. So, Dr. Murtaugh, if you want to comment on your feelings in that arena i would appreciate it yeah i I would just jump on what you just said there bob and that's the the uh fact that this is an entry point uh whether it's and many times it's first-time pet owners and and uh an opportunity for education around uh preventative care and and uh providing them with with uh, additional resources to follow up following that that encounter for the spay neuter and, and uh you know, I, I think it's important that we um, address it not just from a standpoint of population control and, and uh, COVID catch up, but from the for the reasons long term that you're talking about, which is is uh, uh, it, it provides us with an opportunity to get people started right and to give them resources uh, for contact if they have questions uh, as they begin their their life journey with their new family member. You know, so uh, I, I think. Supporting spay neuter is is uh, important for access to care on on pet level, most importantly, and on a lot of levels. So I'm I'm 100 behind it. I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking about the 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 staffing makeup of a veterinary practice. Um, so you have your veterinarian, you've got your technicians, you will have a practice manager. Um, I'm already hearing some people say sometimes it's harder to find the certified uh, veterinary technicians, harder to find a good practice manager. So maybe we're not just being faced with a veterinary shortage, but it's almost a full staffing shortage. Are you seeing that in the clinics that you're visiting? Yeah, most definitely. I mean, I I think we're challenged on all those levels. Maybe I didn't make that point strong enough a, a few minutes ago, but yeah, I mean, we only graduate uh, five thousand uh, veterinary technicians from from two hundred and thirty or so programs across the country on an annual basis. So again, it's the same numbers game that we we face with uh, veterinarians. Is that um, and and the, the other aspect of it with technicians is because we've often underutilized them and underpaid them for significant period of time they go on and do uh nursing on the human side or move outside of the profession and and, uh retention is is uh problematic to some extent with veterinarians but much more problematic with regard to technicians and and uh uh, you know hence i applaud the abma and others efforts to try to highlight and, and move forward on issues of tech utilization and and uh recognition of credentialing and, and all of that stuff, which uh, helps with job satisfaction and retention. The same thing can be said for, you know, certified practice managers. Uh, uh, it's, it's a thankless job and, uh, and many times uh, underpaid for the effort as well. So it, it, there's a lot of turnover and, and uh, a lot of attrition. So I think uh, uh, we need to pay attention to, to ways to 
support all aspects of our veterinary health care team. And you had mentioned uh, one aspect of veterinary technicians not being fully utilized. I would think that maybe there are chances for growth there, or is there a mid-level physician's assistant position? Is there some other new position that could be created that offers a greater level of responsibility to help take some of the pressures off the veterinarians in the practice? Yeah, I think you hit on another uh, key point there from my viewpoint, Stacey, and this gets into more of the sort of intermediate or long-term fixes that can be sustainable. So uh, it's another opportunity for a career track for veterinary technicians. Uh, uh, You know, veterinary technicians in our practices should be doing everything except um, uh, diagnosis, treatment plans, prescribing, and, and surgery. So, so the, a mid-level provider akin to the physician assistant in veterinary medicine would have some of those responsibilities. They could help with the treat and street um, emergencies and, and in urgent care. They could help Dr. Whedon get his spay neuters done because they could do minor surgical procedures or ones where it's repetitive and they can become expert at it. Uh, so, so, and they make more money and, and uh, meet, meet a need. So I think Veterinarians have a hard time letting go, hence the the fact that veterinary technicians are underutilized. I mean, I was just at a meeting this past weekend where a couple of veterinarians my age were talking about the fact that they still, you know, have struggled to not put every catheter in, which is crazy, you know, and uh, stuff like that. So um, I think we need to think broadly and we need to think futuristically about the fact that how come in human medicine they have 500,000 nurse practitioners and physician assistants and people like them and they do a good job and yes are there problems and is there potential liability sure but you know uh don't be uh, stopped by the what ifs when there's the what can be you know so i think that's an area that we need to look at from a collaborative and a, and a broad-based approach uh, the abma's current position is one of uh, it's not important uh, we need to focus on technicians well we need to focus on everything because we have needs that are short-term, long-term, and, and beyond, and, and uh, we're not going to get there if we just do it in a stepwise fashion. We need to do it in a parallel fashion. You know, and I'd like to to build on that. Uh, it's a really good point, Dr. Murtaugh. Um, <laughs> I think for a long time, I was one of those old guys that you were talking about that, you know, had to place my own catheters and take my own radiographs. And it wasn't until I got involved with high quality, high volume spay and neuter that I realized that the level of e- efficiency was so much greater if I do what I do best, which is surgery, and let them do what they do best to get them ready for me to do surgery on. And, you know, 30 years ago, before high quality, high volume spay and neuter became a thing, when we started seeing these spay and neuter clinics popping up, I was like, Oh man, you know, how are they doing this? You know, they cut in corners and, and, and you hear a lot of older veterinarians make that comment. Well, they must be providing substandard care. Actually, you know, there's a lot of evidence that shows that outcomes from a high quality, high volume spay neuter clinic are consistently better because these people do the same thing over and over and over again and they become very good at it. And the human literature supports that same thought. And, and, it, it, it dawned on me that the reason we are so efficient when I'm sitting there doing surgery and I'm looking around and seeing, you know, somebody's recovering, somebody's prepping, somebody's, you know, knocking down. It's almost like a symphony of, of these people who are allowed to practice to their limit of their ability or what they can legally do. And, and so many of us, particularly us older guys, you know, we, we so hard for us to 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 let go and, and to allow that symphony to play. And and I'm 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 just amazed on a daily basis when I see you know when I can personally do thirty to forty surgeries a day. The only way I could do that is by having this support team that is exceptional. And and in in that the same thing is in private practice. The veterinarian doesn't need to be taking his own radiographs, doesn't need to be putting in his own catheters, you know, those sorts of things. Yeah, and I mean, I think that can make a big dent in uh, in practice situations where 
throughput is an issue and access to care is, is problematic and, and uh, in our profession and and uh, but it's still not going to be the whole answer and so i think um, i would come back to the fact that we need to be multifaceted in our approach because the problems are multifaceted as well so dr murtaugh if i'm a veterinarian member of the avma like dr whedon how can we support your candidacy yeah uh, so the election for uh, the avma's president-elect is done by the house of delegates which has uh, an appointed delegate for each state and 20 uh, organizations uh, so there's 70 people that that vote on your behalf and so um, if you're an avma member you have access uh, to that roster of people and can identify who it is in your state that uh, is your delegate and your alternate delegate and you can reach out to them with uh, not only an endorsement of uh, a candidate, but also any issues you might have that you want to bring to their attention so that the ABMA can be aware and and, uh, and act on your behalf and the behalf of others in the profession. And if I am not an ABMA member, but want to support your efforts, is there anything that we can do to help? Yeah, that's a, a little bit of a tricky, slippery slope is that, you know, it, uh, the election rules are AVMA member advocacy and, and uh, you know, otherwise I think uh, you have to be careful. So you can help me indirectly, but not directly so, or any other uh, candidate, if you will. So, But we can certainly support the cause of spay neuter and support yeah. that and, you know, bring that topic to the forefront with our local veterinarians. We support our feline fixed by five veterinarians that we have uh, through the United Spay Alliance. And so with the hopes that Stacy, I hate to interrupt. Go for it. AVMA has endorsed that, yep. which is it was a little surprising to me because they're sometimes very slow to pick up on on these novel things. But the AVMA has endorsed six by five, and which is a great thing. I think more and more veterinarians are now aware of that and are are embracing it as a result. Yes, and we're very grateful and thankful for that. I mean, and I think it is it is wonderful the understanding the importance of fixing a cat before the age of five months, and and that the program is growing and the participation of the veterinary community is growing, regardless of whether it's affordable or not affordable. Private practice, nonprofit organization, it doesn't matter. It's feline fixed by five, and so that's a great uh, unifying force for all of our veterinarians to be together and to build from from that. Dr. Murtaugh, is there anything else you'd like to share with our listeners before we close out today? No, I just uh, uh, you know applaud you, Stacy and, and uh, Dr. Whedon for your efforts on behalf of uh, cats in particular, but uh, you know the pet owning population and, and uh, support for our profession and society. So thanks for the opportunity to be here today and, and uh, uh, the outreach, and, and uh, I look forward to hopefully serving as your next president-elect of the ABMA and helping to push some of these initiatives forward as well. Excellent. Dr. Whedon, any last closing comments on your part? I'd just like to echo what Dr. Murtaugh says that, you know, I said early on that he's a forward thinker, he's a visionary, and and I know that he would support access to care issues. I know he would support spay-neuter being an essential element of access to care and you know, who knows, if we get uh, this legislation passed in Florida, uh, you know, maybe the AVMA then can look at that as a model for other states. And uh, I know that with Dr. Murtaugh uh, in a leadership role with the AVMA, that that would happen. So I, I wish you well and, and we'll continue to advocate for your candidacy. Thank you. Well, I want to thank you both for joining us today. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much for being part of the Community Cats podcast. And hopefully we'll have you on in the future when you're elected. Look forward to that. That's it for this week. Please head over to Apple Podcasts and leave a review. We love to hear what you think and a five-star review really helps others find the show. You can also join the conversation with listeners, cat caretakers, and me on Facebook and Instagram. And don't forget to hit follow or subscribe on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, YouTube, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts so you don't miss a single show. Thanks for listening, and thank you for everything that you do to help create a safe and healthy world for cats.